GM, GM, welcome to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. Don't get caught in the hype cycle. I'm Jay Bird, joined by my co-host Kyle Reedhead, and we believe that the movement economy is going to change the world. That's why we're carving a path for doers to confidently build and invest in Web3. Today, we are talking about building the largest on-ramp in Web3 history by tokenizing movement, aka tokenizing sweat. What the heck does that even mean? Well, fun fact, this app called Sweatcoin has over 140 million users. It's the biggest in Web3 by a long shot, and it has the large, well, the ninth widest held token in crypto, something like over 10 million, I believe, holders, and it's onboarding close to 10,000 new users into Web3 every single day, every single day. It's unbelievable, actually literally unbelievable. And the weird thing is, is no one seems to know about it. I mean, I, so I met Oleg, who's the founder of this company and, and Jay will give a bit more on, on who he is in just a second, but I met him at the Epic Web3 conference because I actually introduced him to speak. I was the MC there and he had a presentation. I didn't, I was like, I don't even know what this thing is, but I sat there and watched it for introducing him. And I was like, wait, what? This is happening? Like, how did I not know about this? It's like, if there's one person, I told him after, I was like, if there's one person that should know about your company, it's probably me because I literally talk about it every day and I've never heard of it. I was mind blown. And I was like, we got to get you on the podcast and learn a bit more because this is just wild. And you know what I love? He actually has a legit business model, a legit token. There's no hype. Like, this is for real. This is everything Jay and I always talk about. Yeah, and this is a an example of a business leader who understands that you don't start with blockchain. Not always. There is some times when you can start with blockchain, but in this case, he said it so many times on the show, Kai. How many times did he say, a business is all about finding a problem and then solving that problem? And that is exactly what he did with Sweatcoin. Prior to finding, founding Sweatcoin in 2014, Oleg founded Bloom FM, which is an innovative award-winning music service that had over 1.2 million users. And before that, he's worked with Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, and Mars as an international consultant at BCG. He's also worked with British Telecom. So Oleg's experience is vast and deep. He's a real gigabrain that understands what we are trying to do when you build a business and then understands how blockchain can amplify that. I met him in Lisbon and uh, we had a couple of beers and it, we kept talking and talking because he's just really, really solid mind, very interesting human and a great guy. So let's just get right in there and listen to it. But before we do, of course, we got to uh, take a second to hear from our sponsors. The future of social media is here and that future lives in Web3 on top of Lens Protocol. Web2 social platforms are broken and ripe for disruption. You see, the epicenter of social media is the creators and yet they are the most neglected. Web2 platforms like Facebook, TikTok and Instagram are all essentially robbing creators of their worth. Creators are a new type of entrepreneur, forming new types of businesses. Yet with Web2 platforms, creators don't own their content or their profiles, and that's their product and business. Instead, they are tied to the platforms they choose to create on. Well, just like how crypto is freeing us from banks, Web3 is freeing us from these centralized platforms. On Lens Protocol, creators own their content, own their profile, and even their social graph and followers in the form of NFTs. This allows you to move freely from one social application to another with your content, profile, and followers moving along with you. Lens Protocol enables self-sovereignty for your social graph and interoperability across the internet. At Web3 Academy, we believe this is the future of social, and that's why we've partnered with Lens to ensure that the path of social media is heading in the right direction. Visit lens.xyz to learn more today. Did you know that Web3 users lose billions of dollars every year due to phishing attacks? If you've been in this space long enough, then you or someone you know has probably fallen victim to one of these scams. This is why we've partnered with WAG, your guardian in this digital wilderness. WAG is a tool designed to help you spot the difference between malicious links and legit ones. With WAG, you can rest easy knowing that every link you click on is safe. This is an absolute game changer for Web3. As part of our partnership with WAG, we'll be using their platform to create verifiable links so that our our community feel safe, knowing that what they're clicking on is the real deal. And if you don't have a community to protect and you're just looking to protect yourself, WAG has you covered with Safe Stops, which tell you exactly who created the link you're clicking on. Head to the link in the description, click it, see that it's verified by Web3 Academy, 
and start protecting yourself today. Just use the code FREE1000 when signing up. And if you're among the first 1,000 users, you'll get free access for life. Oleg, welcome to Web3 Academy. Great to see you. Great to have you today. Thank you very much for having me, guys. Appreciate it. All right, I'm going to jump right in. You've got an app with over 100 million users. I think 140 million. You can tell us the exact number. You're the ninth largest crypto token buy holders. And yet no one has heard of you or not enough people have heard of you. That's for sure. Why is that? Well, I mean, you nailed it. I know mean, that's why I'm so nearly old. That's what keeps me <laughs> awake at night. Really, we build well. Our token is amazing. The story is absolutely incredible. And we're just not hitting buttons. My biggest fear is we're early. My biggest hope is that we're early. And being in bear, in bear market, is actually a blessing for us because we can take all of the successes that we were able to build, build on them. And hopefully, you know, I'm going to show right now, guys, we need an amazing marketing director. If you want a lead project that's going to be top 10, top 20 within the next two years, you know, kind of give me a holler. But basically we have an amazing base, token, app, and community and we are doing really really shit job at the moment in uh, kind of positioning ourselves and telling our story well and i guess this is probably one of the reasons why i'm here because if people listen and they give me time they go like wow this is incredible but because i don't tell it well and i'm not concise i guess everyone just kind of switches off and goes like yeah whatever and you know so we need somebody to help us and, you know, kind of package this, uh, package this better. If I can clarify some of these numbers. So we started in 2014 with Web2 Business, which confusingly was called Sweatcoin because we wanted to be on blockchain, but we couldn't build it on blockchain. And that is the business that has more than 140 million registered users. Last year, we expanded into Web3 and we're building on Near, where we have more than 10 million token holders, you know, kind of counts vary. More than 7 million people in our non-custodial wallet, sweat wallet. And this is the business that we're talking about right now, that is built off the Web 2 into Web 3. For people who are crypto curious, for people that wanted and really, really keen to join Web 3, but had this two barriers, you know, and it's interesting, people are talking always about how do we drive people from to, to Web3? The answer is very simple. It's actually two things that stop people. One is stop talking yield farming, staking, and, you know, they've all, people don't understand what the hell it is. They don't engage, they turn around and walk away. So that also includes UX. Build UX that is not you know, kind of technical, not for engineers, you know, kind of just look at, you know, mass market apps and you will see what kind of UXs people are expecting. And the second thing is don't ask for credit card when the first bloody screen, because these people read newspapers. The first thing that newspaper prints about crypto right now, 600 million installed and 400 million drain. They think that it's going to be them that's going to lose their money. So you get to give them an explanation, what are they doing here, how they're doing it, and don't ask for money first. And this is where we come in, in a very, very good way, because over the last nine years, we'll learn how to build good UX, and we literally allow you to walk into crypto. We don't ask for your money at all. Is it life-changing amounts? No, but that's not what these people are seeking. They're seeking knowledge. They're seeking ability to understand. And once they're comfortable, all of a sudden you're starting to get that crypto curious into kind of being really, really keen and becoming crypto native. And I guess to clarify too, of course, if there's a hundred and I think you said 40 million users, people yeah. have heard of Sweat. They've heard of your business. It's the Web3 community that hasn't necessarily heard about Sweat Coin, which like as much as that sucks and you're looking for a marketer to help you in the Web3 side of things. I think the good yeah. thing is, and this is something Jay and I was talking about is like, the way that Web3 is going to go in the future is the tech is going to be in the background, right? We're not even going to really know we're using it. And that's kind of what you've done. You've got 140 million users. 
X percent. I don't know what that is. I think you said 10 million have a self-custodial wallet. So a certain percentage of them are using crypto, whether they even really understand what that is or not, which is the whole point of this thing. We love that. But I think your thing is, hey, we also need the Web3 community to understand because you like support. You're one of the you're one of the apps that are onboarding the most people every single day into Web3. And yet Web3 is not talking about it, which is just wild. So that's why we're so excited to have you on here. For those listeners that have never heard of this and they're like, what are you guys talking about? Give us a bit of a background. What is Sweatcoin, Sweat Economy? Talk about the business a little bit, maybe the origin story. What is it you've built? And then we're going to dive into a lot of things from there. Awesome. Okay. Well, it started in 2014. My previous business perished in really unfortunate circumstances. And I had to let 30 people go. And I had to go for a run to clear my head and to think sorry thoughts. And... I tried to really kind of kick myself uh, in the nuts and run very fast. And I realized I couldn't even complete 5K. And just three years before, I was climbing some of the highest mountains in the world. And that really kind of made me think, oh, shit, what happened? Like in three years, how come that I lost all of my fitness and sort of power and energy and, you know, agility? And uh, I started talking to my now co founders, and we very quickly realized that. The reason why everybody wants to be more active than they are, and it hundred percent of people are like that. You know, can you talk to somebody who is depressed, sitting with a beer at eleven o'clock in the morning watching TV, and somebody who is training for marathon? All the people want to be more active than they are right now. And the reason why they can't, and the reason why they never will be, is because nature doesn't want you to. Nature builds us to survive. Nature didn't build us to burn calories. Nature built us to preserve calories because that's how survival happened. And therefore, unless there was a food on the horizon or you were about to become food to someone or something, we didn't run. We just sat around the fire. And that's basically what nature wants us to do. And we continue doing it. And once you're realizing this is just universal and very, very simple explanation, you realize that there is an answer to it and it's called instant gratification. So if you start turning the relationship with steps as a sort of the lowest common denominator physical activity from wasteful from the nature perspective to gainful, all of a sudden you are subtly starting to help people to change their habits. And we basically said, you know, kind of, we're going to let you turn your steps into currency. And we called it Sweatcoin and we put an MVP out and it flew and, you know, people absolutely loved it. I'm not going to go into sort of blockchain details because at the beginning we had this really convoluted and very interesting kind of technical way of doing it, but we quickly realized it wouldn't work. But the concept stuck and interestingly, investors started coming out of woodwork. People were really, really excited and energized by the idea, oh, you're going to burn calories instead of kind of megawatts of energy to create crypto. Ooh, this is interesting. So we launched and, you know, kind of it flew. Led Bible of all things actually brought us like 30 or 40,000 first users. They put crazy sort of headline, app pays you to get off your arse. And all of a sudden it just kind of went viral, Twitter, whatever. And we got a lot of users. And the feedback was sort of overwhelmingly positive. As I mentioned, we couldn't build on blockchain because it was only Bitcoin. It was too slow, too expensive. And we just decided we're going to go centralized and we're going to jump on blockchain a bit later. And this is 2014. So this is previous to like Ethereum. 2014. This is, right. Yeah. Previous to ICO. So you were way ahead thinking like, oh, I'm going to tokenize yeah. this. That wasn't even a thing at the time, just to give context for those, for the listeners. I was uh, at the first meetup that Vitalik had in London. There were like 15 people there. You know, you could, you know, he wasn't mobbed like he did right now. No security. Uh, you know, you could just come and talk to him. We actually met with him in late 2015 to discuss our idea and who could build on Ethereum. We spent quite a bit of time talking to his team and we realized that, you know, kind of it was way early because it was a year before they did an ICO and close to two years before they actually launched. So basically, neither Bitcoin nor Ethereum were an option. And despite our name, Sweatcoin, we actually ended up being a Web2 centralized 
business, but everyone loved the name. It kind of made sense. And we just started scaling and launching new geographies. And it was, you know, kind of unbelievably fascinating to kind of watch the engagement and also the fact that, you know, because as a business, we focused on solving a problem rather than coming up with idea, the whole thing was extremely viral. You know, kind of our growth was due to word of mouth, especially in the US. It was really quite interesting. We'd get into a school, a kid would talk to his friends kind of during the break, would get quite a lot of installations. And then they would come home and they would talk to their moms and they would kind of say, mom, you're fat. You always want to lose weight. Why don't you get this uh, app? It will help you to do that. Don't worry about sweat points. Send them to me. I'll figure out how to spend them. And moms install it and then moms start talking and then another mom installs and then another school explodes. So it was just really quite an interesting and bizarre dynamic that we absolutely did not expect that really kind of took us kind of a couple of years, I think, to polish and perfect it, but it worked amazingly well. Even now, if you look at, you know, those 140 million users, probably about 90, more than 90% of that have been organic, you know, that joined uh, through the word of mouth. Every year we were looking back at Bitcoin space and were sort of evaluating projects. And we were sort of, at the beginning, it was really dire, especially during ICO boom. We were just sitting there, should we, shouldn't we? And we even prepared white paper. But then when the flood of crooks and scammers and crap just sort of became, you know, overwhelming, it just kind of went, nah you know what, we don't want to go in there because it sort of became almost like you do what? So we basically took a pause and we continued scaling our web to business until about 2019 when we came across the predecessor of Polkadot. What was their name? Don't remember right now. The project was called something else. And we actually took the research grade code and managed to get 500 transactions per second on 100 nodes from them, kind of went, ooh, ooh, this is starting to get better. But because we were already processing 700 to 800 transactions per second at peak, we kind of went, you know what, this is too far-fetched and we don't want to become all of a sudden blockchain development company. We want to focus on making the world more physically active and build on blockchains that, you know, kind of will have their own teams. And in 2021, all of a sudden, I don't know if you guys know, in London, they always joke that buses either don't come or come in trains. 2021 <laughs> was this sort of, you know, 15 buses arrive at the same time. You know, all of a sudden, you just have Algorand, you have Solana, you have Near, amazing projects with a really, really good technology. It was just like a massive breakthrough. And we got really excited, built a team and looked at more than a dozen different projects and selected Near. We can delve into it. You know, I can explain to you the logic and how we arrived to that decision. But we are very, very happy. You know, nine months from launch, we're very, very happy with the partnership. They, you know, the guys are totally amazing. But then when we made the decision, basically what we've done, we gave our users an opportunity. We said, look, you or many of you were expecting that we would be crypto. Now we can become crypto. You take an option, take a pick if you want. You just opt in, you create a near address, and then at the time of TGE, you would be able to effectively match the amount of sweat coins that you had in your balance for sweat. That is a crypto token. This way, because every sweat coin has a history, it's backed by what we call a blockchain. So there is never sweat coin or sweat that came into existence without a string of steps with timestamps and corresponding telemetrics that, you know, kind of we collect that exist. So if somebody wants to prove that the whole token mass that exists right now is backed by the physical activity, we can send them into kind of into our servers and do the analysis. Oh, so, before we go into blockchain, yeah. though, why don't we take a step back? I want to dive into all things blockchain and sweat and how you've tokenized sweat, which is the way you explained it to me when I met you in Lisbon, which was really cool. Let's just talk about the business for a second, because we went from 2014 to yeah. you know now at 140 million users. You're like, okay, now I want to get on a blockchain. Let's go back for a second. And just mm -hmm. what is the business? Because this is the thing I want people to understand is like people yeah. have heard of Step In, right? That took Storm back in what was it 2021, 2022. 
bit different. You have an actual business here with 140 million users, non-blockchain related, that is profitable and a good business. And I think this is the thing I want the community in Web3 to understand is that it's not the token that is making you the money or that is making you the business. This is a thing that can amplify the experience for the users. So let's just talk about the business for a second. What is the business and yeah. what is the model of that? How do you guys make money? Like walk us through that so we understand just the like the dynamics of that first. Absolutely. Not many people in Web3 sort of want to delve into that, but I agree with you that so we like the main pillar. That's the problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so as I mentioned, kind of the main pillar of our success is that we focused on the problem. And the problem is that people feel frustrated that they're not active enough. And if you give them an opportunity to kind of solve that problem without sacrificing anything, and that's where the magic is, because now if you want to be more active, you got to buy a gym membership or you got to buy a Peloton bike for two and a half grand. It's always spending. And here it sort of becomes, it flips its on the head and says, actually, it makes you active and it pays you as opposed to you paying. And people kind of go, what? What the hell? How is that possible? And quite a lot of people join us, not because it's such an amazing proposition and they're excited. They're joining because they're like, this is fucked up. I don't believe that this is work. <laughs> it can't. They pay me to walk. How the fuck is that possible? And they come in and they kind of look around and get, oh, yeah, and it does make sense. And the business is very simple to start with. You come in and you walk and you're getting paid for it in sweat coins, which is, of course, the currency that we've created. And you spend it with our partners who give you amazing deals that are not available anywhere else on, under no circumstances for the sweat coins. Why does that happen? Because there are thousands of businesses that are interested in physically active people or people who are trying to be physically active, health, fitness, sport, nutrition, fashion, vanity, makeup, dog accessories, supplements, healthy food, you know, kind of countless businesses are actually the segment that they're going after are the aspiring athletes. And this is exactly what we have. And unlike Zuckerberg or, you know, Brin. We're not telling you that, you know, kind of these people expressed an interest in being active. We know they are. So if you want to target hardcore athletes, you put a very high price in sweat coins. And in order to achieve that balance, you actually have to be really, really active and walk or run a lot. If you're interested in millions of users, but the ones that have right sort of psychographic and right attitude, then you put low value in sweat coins and then you have huge 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 addressable market so very quickly we ended up having three business models first one is partnerships brands pay us to get exposure to tens of millions of people second one is advertising a lot of brands want to get in front of physically active or wanting to be physically active audience and because the way we implemented ads when we restricted the number so unlike, you know, can a lot of places where banners would be flashing, you know, can you'd be interrupted from what you're doing with ads, we actually hit them and we said, if you don't interact with them, don't interact with them. But if you do, just bloody watch the whole thing from beginning till the end. And we have some of the highest levels of engagement. And because of that, we have some of the latest, highest levels of CPMs in the industry as well. And the third one is premium subscription. So we have premium model. Some people are on free app, some people pay premium. If you combine the two for multiple years, actually until we started working on Web3, we were profitable. And the reason why we are burning a little bit right now is actually because we're over-investing and putting a lot of money into building Web3 business. The team, the tech, kind of the brand, absolutely everything. So it's not like, you know, we had a failing business and all of a sudden we went into Web3 and because of the salt and NFT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To prop up the, you know, yeah, something yeah. that wasn't working. It, so it was solid which, business. Which is exactly what we need more of is solid businesses that are using Web3 to amplify their business, using blockchain. So... I understand I'm a user on Sweatcoin, I earn Sweatcoins, and then I can go spend them with your partners 
to get discounts, to get deals, to yeah. get access to things that I wouldn't get access to otherwise. I might also be a heavy user, so I upgrade to the premium, the paid subscription in order to get access to other features. What did the shift to blockchain enable? What did you look at and say, okay, now what can we do that we couldn't do before that we can do as a result of blockchain? Why blockchain? Because what we just said is you've got a business, 100 plus million users, you're making however much money. I think you've got like 100 and something employees. So business is good. Web two. These when we say currency, the sweat thing, it's not actually a crypto at this point. It's just like a credit point. Like it's like yeah, like an Air Miles point kind of thing. Yeah. So the business is great. You've you've got a phenomenal business idea here. It's it's doing really well, and you've been wanting to get blockchain this whole time. Why? What does Web three do, or what does that technology do to amplify what you currently have? Very astute question. It opens the sort of next stage to achieve our vision and the mission is to make the world more physically active and app is a great tool and it will affect some people but our vision is to create what's called movement economy and you think of attention economy right so about 200 years ago we started figuring out that attention is valuable now we have this by some estimates seven trillion dollar you know economy where basically we're buying and selling somebody's attention and what is the value of attention it is attracting someone's attention so that you can deliver them a message and hopefully there will be some value exchange right now what other things do humans do that is objectively valuable and somebody has you know a lot of money and a lot of will to pay for physical activity because if you're physically active, you paying for it now with your gym membership, with your sports kit, with that Peloton bike, et cetera, et cetera. Your family is extremely interested in that because you know that their fathers are, you know, kind of happier. They are fitter. They're going to live longer. They are in a better mood. Your doctor or healthcare provider, you know, kind of is amazing saving because it's a preventative medicine as opposed to dealing with uh, with the situation when, you know, you're already ill. If you're thinking of insurers, especially health insurers and life insurers, this is an incredibly good business and they know that very well. Employers, you know, if you're physically active, you're going to be more productive. You're going to take fewer sick days. Countries, if you are physically active, you're going to live longer. The total amount of tax collected from you is going to be greater. So everyone benefits. So physical activity creates an incredible amount of wealth and yet we can only talk about it. You know, the doctor says, oh, you've got to be more physically active or, you know, can you have an ad that, you know, walking is really good for you. Why can't we turn this into a tradable liquid asset where all of a sudden everyone would know that physical activity has tangible value? To achieve that with a centralized app and the token points in it is extremely difficult because it needs to have financial expression. It needs to be traded on exchanges. And that's why we always wanted to be in crypto, because if you want to create currency, physical activity turn into currency, you can either have a country, which is frowned upon these days. I mean, you know, some people still try to, you know, do something about it, but generally I think that this is in the past, or you have to go into crypto, right? And be on blockchain. And that's basically our vision. And we have created sweat effectively as a tokenized physical activity and our vision is that in the future when people will be talking about why is sweat valuable because i think that the question in web3 is not going to be what is the utility of your token or what is the all of the scientific things that people throw around because if you think about money why does dollar have value why does this have value why is that valuable so why is sweat valuable? Because it is a representation of my physical activity. It's not worthless. It's not zero. You will never give it for nothing. If you were, then if somebody kind of calls you and says, can you bring us some beers? You just jump up and deliver it to them. No, you wouldn't. It's your time and your physical activity. It's extremely valuable. So we are trying to tokenize this and create this as an, into an asset so that somebody in the future, reads a newspaper article and it says physical activity pumped 20% last week. Yeah. And I go, fuck, why don't I participate in this? Why 
am I not on this treadmill? And all of a sudden, they start becoming a lot more active. That creates a lot of value for them, for their families, for their healthcare provider, for their insurer, for their employer, and for their country. And if we take a chunk of that, it would be a very, very sizable business. If attention economy is $7 trillion, which is what about 5x the whole crypto, I think that physical activity or movement economy can be a lot bigger because healthcare, productivity, life expectancy, you know, kind of, I don't know, I'm not macroeconomist, but I think we're talking comparable size here. And even if we get 10% of that, I'll take $700 billion. Well, like, can you connect the dots for me on this? I get where, like you explained, there's countries, there's brands, there's insurance companies, et cetera, that all want to pay for sweats and their <laughs> physical activity, right? Because they want to get in front of these people. They want to know how active these people are. And the more active they are, they might give them cheaper rates in their insurance, or they might give them, I don't know, less taxes or whatever, because they know they're going to live longer, et cetera. So I see the value. And then I see yeah. where a user can basically tokenize or like get points for the activity that they're doing. Yeah. Connect that for me though. How does that value like match? Is it you're getting all these brands, insurance and governments, and then the money they're giving you put into this token somehow so that these people actually get the value? Like how does the monetary aspect actually make sense here? That's what I'm trying to, to help mm -hmm. connect. If you can do that. Yeah, it makes sense. So you asked me kind of why blockchain and that giving you sort of the end goal. The end goal is in order for us to create movement economy, we need a token and a currency that will power all of those value exchanges. Why is this token valuable? The way and where does this value come from? The way to think about it is like a startup, right? So if the end goal is to have a token that is a tokenized physical activity by everyone's sort of admission and valuation, then this is not something that you can start with because people kind of go, but how much does it cost? So, you know, I know it's not zero, but you know, can, it's very confusing. It's a new concept. So we have to build it. And this is like a startup. You raise VC money. And in our world, this is going to be monetizing your attention to start with. So you know, can, you're physically active, you in crypto. We are now effectively introducing you to this project that gives you exposure to, I don't know, NFTs, or this project that offers you an opportunity to participate in the metaverse, or this project that gives you a 0% tax trading, right? All of these introductions generate revenue for Sweat Wallet that we have committed. 50% of our profit is going to go into buying tokens on the open market. So in order to bootstrap the story and help it grow like a newborn baby, we don't expect newborn baby to run kind of sing songs and solve algebra equations. So this is the kind of future. Right now, we're bootstrapping it through effectively raising money through different business models. I've described three to you. They're perfectly replicable in Web3. In addition, it's fees. When you facilitate purchase of a token or when you facilitate swap of the token, there are fees that are generated. Everyone knows that MetaMask is a very, very big business, you know, basically with one single revenue generator, which is 0.85% charge on the swap amounts, right? So we have that additional revenue streams. Then you think about our game that we have just launched, and I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit more, which is Sweat Hero which is uh, three innovations in one. And that is a token sync as well. So what ends up happening is that people use sweat to get utilities and to get entertainment and enjoyment from the whole ecosystem. That allows us to extract sweat out of the system in so-called token syncs. Then community votes what to do with it. And so far, they overwhelmingly been burning. And therefore our actual token that everyone sort of complains it's inflationary because we don't have a capped supply because if you're rewarding physical activity, you don't want to say in 20 years time, yeah. sorry, don't want to it. we you know, had a valued movement then, but right now we don't give a shit. So you might go and sit and drink beer and don't move. Now that's not really kind of, kind of long-term planning. So we can't do that. Therefore, 
we do have uncapped supply from a mathematics perspective, but what we do have is an understanding that it doesn't matter if you have capped supply or uncapped supply, what matters is to be deflationary, which means that the amount of tokens available at the end of the period is lower than the number of tokens at the beginning of the period because the business is operating, it's growing, more users, more revenues, but the number of tokens is declining. So if you divide one by another, if denominator is reducing, then the value of single unit, simple mass, is going up. Scarce. That's exactly what we are doing. And all the activities that we have right now, all the functionalities are focused on two things. Thing one is active users. And we'll get into metrics. This is being my bonnet because I do think that the industry, we're not focusing on right metrics right now and is really not taking us into the right place. And the second thing is supply and demand or basically becoming deflationary. And with all these different functionalities that we're launching, we are going to become a deflationary token from the end of this month, which is unbelievably hard to do even for you know, for Bitcoin, for example, because Bitcoin is not deflationary. Our listeners understand this well because we talk a lot about Ethereum and the developments they've made over the last few years, which has now made it deflationary. They have an endless supply. There's no cap on, on ETH, yeah. yet they are deflationary because of, like you said, token sinks, things that burn yeah. tokens. Let me give a quick summary of the token here of like what you guys have created. So basically, you've tokenized sweats. So the more you are active, the more of these tokens you get. The more of these tokens you get, the more you can buy things, get discounts on things, get access to things, whatever that may be. So there's your sort of economy that you've created. Now, the issue you're saying is that, well, if this stuff gets too inflationary, if everyone just keeps working out, there's an unlimited amount of, of tokens. So that's a problem. The next thing you want is, well, we need to value around these. So if we put it on crypto, meaning an open global marketplace, then people can buy and sell them. So meaning you can get these tokens from exercising or you can just buy them and that can get you the access and the things. But again, if there's just an unlimited amount and it's always inflating, then this thing's never going to have value. That's what happened with like Step in Axie Infinity. We've talked a lot about these other games essentially that have overinflated. And so there's a bunch of things that you've done where transactions, using a wallet, if you do all these things, it actually burns. So that helps. The other thing that we haven't mentioned yet that uh, you explained to me that's quite important, that's similar to the way that Bitcoin works, is the more that someone exercises, the harder it gets to earn the same amount of tokens. So meaning... Yeah. Let's say you work out for, I don't know the numbers here, but let's say you work out for five minutes, you get two tokens. The next time you got to work out for 10 minutes to get two tokens. And then it's 20 minutes to get two tokens. And so like the more you go, the harder it gets to earn. And so that sort of suppresses the amount of tokens that are being created. And it, that's what kind of generates a bit of value around that because it's actually hard to get these tokens. So the yeah. harder you're working, the more you can start to sell these things and make or get access to things or whatever you want. And so that's what sort of like creates this yeah. economy which is like gold. It's like hard to create more gold. There's some inflation, but it's harder to do it. That's like this is you get good at it, but then it just keeps getting more and more challenging. And that's how Bitcoin works. Really? That Very eloquently delivered what probably took me like two hours over the year. Uh, <laughs> I think the, the other way you could compare it is like carbon credits, right? Sweat credits are, are similar to carbon credits. If, you, if the listeners are familiar with those, which is basically like there's only a certain amount of carbon that you can use. If you happen to use less, you can sell that to others. And then that amount goes down and down. And so carbon credits has been tokenized. It's on normal exchanges, not necessarily crypto, but some of it is on crypto as well. And that's become this massive economy, this new financial asset. And you're basically creating the same thing, but out of sweat, which I think is super, super cool. So hopefully that was a good summary. And listeners, hopefully that yeah. helped you guys wrap your head around this. Because I know it's... Can I difficult. add this small twist? I think the, the way we arrived to it, we, we call it sweat value. Sorry, step value of sweat. The way we arrived to that was actually not through the economics. We arrived to it through mission because our mission is to make the world more physically active. And if I make next sweat harder to mint, I am creating motivation for you to walk earlier and more, which means that there is more physical activity produced at any given point in time because it basically punishes procrastination. That was the first degree. And the second sort of degree was, ooh, and it also ensures that no matter how far we scale in terms of users and their physical activity, there is always going to be diminishing inflation in the monetary mass. So if you look in perpetuity, the inflation is approaching zero. 
if you exclude all the burns, etc. So if we were not burning anything, nothing was going on, you would still have nearly asymptotic line, nearly horizontal line in the future, like 100, 100 years. But because we have those token sinks, and because we're spending 50% of our profit on buying tokens on the open market, the actual number of tokens is, as I mentioned, is going to start declining from the end of this month already. So here's what I love. We have a business that's profitable. We have a shit ton of users. We have a token that is sustainable. These are all the things you want in a, in a tokenized economy, right? In a tokenized business. We don't have many of these in Web3 at all. Um, and so it's kind of funny that you're like not only the biggest, one of the only ones to be sustainable, like other than ETH, there's not much other ones that actually have sustainable economy. And so you've got all these things. And yet again, people still don't know about you so much in the Web3 world. And so maybe we should dive into that unless, Jay, I'm not sure if you have any other questions. Or maybe what we want to do is just kind of get the understanding of why you chose Near and what that journey was like. I'm not sure which route we want to take. What do you guys think? Let's go down the Near path because we had uh, Aurora Cloud on recently and we talked mm -hmm. to them, them. We talked about Near as well. So yeah. you're the second in a month to come on and be on the near protocol. So it also doesn't have the marketing either that ETH has or the reputation that ETH has. But here we are with another amazing project and not yet going nears. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Not yet. So well, give walk us, us through that decision. Yeah. Walk us through why you chose near. Yeah. I mean, it's a very astute observation and in many ways, this is also the reason why we've chosen them because as you know, we've started nearly nine years ago. And one thing that we know in order to have a solid business, you really have to think about the problem and the product that solves it. And once you figured out these two, then you can start building business model and marketing on top of it. And this is missing in a lot of projects that we've encountered, even in layer ones. You know, can it's absolutely incredible how many layer ones that, you know, can are successful if you actually start looking under the hood and you do the hard testing and digging into code and testing of the throughput on 100 nodes, 2000 nodes, you realize, you know, kind of that they actually don't have a velocity. They have a claimed velocity, but, you know, kind of in production, it is not going to materialize. So as I said, in 2021, we build a whole team here to look at all the different tech and after about three months we were so bloody confused because everyone was throwing at us things that mattered to them but if you tried to reconcile all of these things across multiple projects there would be kind of no crossover so there is no way to compare and then we took a pause and we basically looked at so what do we actually need and we realized that there are several things that matter to us. One is strategic alignment. Where is this project going? Not only from kind of website and declared goals, but from the conversations with the founding team. So, you know, kind of are we aligned on that? And we'll get into details in a second. The second thing was chemistry with the team, because, I mean, we'll know that, you know, can people that you work with, Chemistry, team, and, you know, the vibe that you're getting from the team matters tremendously. And the third, but not least, is tech, throughput, robustness, et cetera, et cetera. So the last bit is reasonably straightforward. We kind of tested a bunch of different tech and, you know, kind of we realized that we possibly could build on Nair. We possibly could build on Solana. But actually, if you start pushing Solana for the actual transactions, not those 400,000 transactions that they call transactions, you realize that throughput is actually not beating nears. And then they have periodically this, you know, kind of outages that you never know how long they're going to last. So that was the sort of thing with Solana that, you know, kind of basically made us go, hmm, you know, kind of we're not doing it on the side. It's mission critical. We cannot go with a chain that sort of periodically dies for 17 hours or 48 hours. Our support is going to be absolutely mobbed and killed. So we cannot afford this. <laughs> then coming up to the team, chemistry is extremely important. 
I really enjoyed my first meeting with Ilya Polasukin, who is the founder. He's a kind of true builder and, you know, he's thinking immediately in tech and code and throughput and answers to specific questions. And if he says he'll do something, he does it. It's absolutely incredible. There are, there are so many people in Web3 that, you know, would sort of paint a, you know, massive cloud. And if you look behind it, then, you know, there is, there is no substance. So... I really enjoyed that meeting, and then I started meeting wider team that he has assembled, and it's absolutely incredible. So we would have fantastic relationship. It's not the easiest because you know sometimes you have to solve sort of complicated things, and we, for example, have some dependency in some questions on their technology. And when we were launching, we were nervous, they were nervous, everyone was nervous because who has done TGE with 13 million addresses and tokens to be allocated. Nobody. It was biggest TGE factor 10. So it went absolutely smoothly and Nier has slowed down a little bit, but it carried us through and it works unbelievably well, you know, now and we have fantastic relationship. Now, probably to the most important thing that a lot of people, when I talk to people, especially in Web3, they don't pay enough attention to is strategic alignment. Let me give you an example. So we are a B2C business. We have more than 100 million users. Our specialty is kind of dealing with huge number of users, consumers, right? We're not an institution. We're not, you know, kind of big entity. And if you start talking to chains, all of them jump on, oh, you have so many users. Yeah, we definitely let's talk. But if you start talking to them, you realize that the business development team is focusing on banks and large enterprises, and their solution is geared towards sort of selling massive, you know, kind of chunks of bandwidth and throughput to, you know, kind of to TradFi, for example. Even if they are keen to work with you, and even if they're keen to give you money, that's not going to work because the heads on a completely different place. They're thinking about one, two, three, four deals per year. This is the size of the deal. They are not measuring their success by number of active wallets or active users. They are using completely different metrics. And therefore, no matter how hard you try or however much money you receive, that is going to sour because you're walking in different directions. So everyone who listens and everyone who is interested, I'm always saying, think about that. And make sure that you use that as a first criterion, because even if everything else matches, that is something that is going to turn into a conflict or an issue and not terribly sort of far down the line, you know, kind of six months to a year, and you'll be already seeing cracks in the relationship. So because NEAR is about bringing next billion people into Web3, and it's not just a declare strategy, but the chain is about high throughput. We tested it and we were able to get more than 1,000 transactions per second at peak. And because the architecture is built in a way that if we need more, then they're adding shards and it scales up. So we don't have a ceiling in the technology all of a sudden in them. They also have some of the cheapest transactions you know, among any chains out there, which means that if you go in for the next billion people, they're not going to be whales. They're not going to be people coming in with, I don't know, 10 grand of a balance. They'll have $3, $5. If your transaction on Ethereum is $8, how can you do anything for these people? That's a, it's a non-starter. It's like an alien world for them. Or near, and you're talking about fraction of a fraction of a cent. And all of a sudden, these people can actually, they come in with a, you know, one, two, three dollars. They can stake, they can win rewards, they can transfer, they can receive, they can send their money into centralized exchanges, and all of that with the balances that they have. And it's a single dollar balance. So if you think about bringing people into Web3, giving them confidence in their first steps so that they understand what they're doing, how it all works. And all of a sudden, you have an audience that then you can start convincing if they have another five dollars, put it into crypto to go into another chain. And that's what we're doing. That's why we're calling ourselves the biggest on-ramp in Web3 history. A lot of people are talking about it, 
But when you actually look at the product, they say, oh, we have 900% APY yield. You know, what does yes. it mean? If you have three bucks, you don't know what yes. yield is. <laughs> and even if you give me 900% of three bucks, I have to lock it away, but it's parallel universes and it really is fascinating. And I'm going to have a, another talk tomorrow, which is going to be called, you know, whales versus minnows and who should we focus on? Because I think as an industry, we are really focusing on whales for way too long. There are so many projects that you talk to. And again, what they're interested in is bringing in more liquidity because everyone is focusing on TVL, total value lock. And why is total value lock matter? Because their business models typically is not linked to TVL because the charges, if you're, for example, layer one, the, the money you make or the tokens that you sync are based on transactions. It doesn't matter if it was a $1 billion transaction or $1 transaction. The cost of this transaction is absolutely the same. So if you start thinking what matters is millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people using this system because that will generate an incredible amount of value for everybody. It is not 10 people who've got 1 billion liquidity who tout around their liquidity from one project to another who gives them the highest level of APYs because you have it today, tomorrow somebody gives 10% more and that billion is gone there. And it's a zero sum game while attracting hundreds of millions of minos is the growing of the ecosystem and bringing more people that will be the future of web three businesses. And that's why I'm excited about being on near because we can do that. If you're building on EVM and your transaction cost right now, is 50 cents, $1, you still can't cater to this audience. You know, it's too expensive for them. And there is no product that you can offer them that they would be able to consume, at least at this stage. That's why there is very, very little sort of, well, actually, if you look at all the different chains out there, there aren't that many chains that can play this role of on-ramping people into Web3. And Near is definitely one of them. And that's the reason why I'm so bullish on Near. So how uh, many minnows are you onboarding per day right now? <laughs> So about 10,000, 10, 20,000 10, per day. Yeah. A day. Meaning, they're, meaning, and by when you say onboard, they're creating a new wallet or right. activating a wallet. So here's what I'd love to just discuss here. So first, great explanation. Thank you so much for that. And I, and I love, I think a lot of people just try to create these like consumer apps that are going to be the next billion people. And they put it on this like blockchain that's never going to do it. And it's like trying to put a square peg in a circle hole. You know what I mean? It's like, that was never going to work. And that's all, so many of that I see in Web3 where, Whereas you just said, we're just going to wait. Let's build the app. Let's build the business. Let's get the users. But let's not try to put a square peg in a circle hole. And let's just keep building what we can here. And when the tech is ready, then we can start to do it. And that's kind of where Mir came in. And, and so great story there. The one thing that's interesting is that it's still not that easy for you to do this. You actually have two apps. So there's the Sweat app. And then there's a Sweat wallet. They're actually two different things. And so I'll give you just a coin and Sweat wallet. Yeah. Right. So Sorry. coin and yeah. Sweat wallet. What I really like about what you've done, though, is so everyone uses Sweatcoin. It's actually funny that that's called Sweatcoin. I feel like you need to change that as a marketer. <laughs> and I know you don't have a market word for it. What did it to be? I'm going to give you advice. 2014. <laughs> that was it's, a, right it's a great idea. brand. It's a Sweat economy. I like, I like that a lot. But yeah. so anyway, so you have this app that is, there's no mention of like crypto or any of this kind of stuff. It's just you use this thing, you burn these credits, and you can get all these like great bonuses and things like that. So it's great. Yeah. No financial talk. But then you have this other app, which is Sweat Wallet, which is, hey, if you do this and you like all this stuff and all that, but you also care about the financial world and maybe you want to not just use this for perks and benefits, maybe you want to sell some of it. Maybe you want to go and use other things in DeFi and you want to financialize these things you're earning, then you can do that too. And so you download this app. That app is just a custodial wallet and boom, you're in the system. Non -custodial. Non, sorry, non-custodial wallet and boom, now you're in the system and you can basically convert those tokens into like a crypto one and now you can go play around in the financial world and so it's exactly. like but you don't have to do that you're not forcing people to get this wallet to load it up with some eth or in this instance i don't know what the token is that you need for transaction fees and near but like you don't have to go through all those hurdles to use the sweat app instead you just get to use the app and then if you care about the financial stuff which is not the bulk of people in this world then you can go do it and that's what i really like about this you're not 
forcing people to do financial things first, you're letting them just use the app. And then if they want financial stuff, they can go do that next. I think that's a really good experience. Is that why you have two apps or is that because Apple Store or like what was the reason you you separated them? So two reasons. The main reason was when we started, you know, kind of in 2021, when we started looking into blockchain and we realized it's happening, we had two work streams. One was looking what chain we're building on. Another one was doing consumer research. And the research showed that, <laughs> you know, when we went into research, we had the question, so, do people still think about drugs uh, when they hear crypto? No. And we have a lot of 55-year-old moms, and they're interested in crypto. We're like, wow, that's cool. And then the next thing that was uh, sort of bothering us is like, you know, are they interested? Do they really want to get into crypto? And everyone wants, and I described to you already two issues. They didn't understand what the hell was going on and how to get in. And some of them even tried to get wallets. But once they saw 24 words that they needed to record somewhere and they were told, don't take a screenshot, don't copy. But if you lose, everything's gone. They kind of just too complicated. I didn't understand, you know, kind of it's just not something that they even complete. And what we realized is that they just need a good UX. I mean, this is like, you know, can you remember early days of graphical interface oh, I'm showing my age here. You know, I remember command line and MS DOS and all of that. And all of a sudden, oh my God, there is you know there is a button and there is a mouse and you click and oh my God, it works. That's the same thing. You know, and right now if you go into a lot of Web3 products, they would be developed for, you know, kind of extremely savvy people. We discussed, for example, trading functionality in our app. When we started looking at the trading functionality, we of course looked at all the best examples and the example that it still fascinates me, the swap functionality. You go in and you choose the token that you want to sell. And then the SDK or whatever the DEX gives you information how much of the token that you want to buy, you can get an exchange for that token. Then you press a button and smart contract does some magic and you receive your new token. It really is quite weird because this is not the type of shopping that we do in any other environment under any circumstance. This would be like walking to 7-Eleven and kind of screaming, I've got $7.11, what can I get for it? Who shops like that? I mean, nobody does that, right? I mean, it's insane. You're laughing when I mention this. So it needs to go from the completely opposite direction. So what do you want to buy? Right? Okay, milk and two, you know, whatever breads. Okay, that's going to be this. And then... You need to figure out how can you allow people to potentially pay some with this token and some with another token or top up with a card. You know, kind of just think about basics of how humans, especially not very well versed in crypto native, would be thinking about these types of transactions. And this is basically the functionality that we're building right now. We call it trading. And you will choose what you want to buy. And then you will choose the uh, multitude of different tokens or methods of payment that this is what humans expect from interfaces so sorry very long-winded but you know can we really need to think about the users and these new users and not trying to force our kind of perceived way of how things work down the throat of next hundred million because that is not how our industry is, is going to evolve and how it is going to develop very interesting Jay, do you have another question you were just about to ask? Yeah, I got a few things I want to touch on. I want to touch on the governance votes that you've had because you've had some record-setting governance votes. I want to touch on that. I also want to touch on Sweat Hero, the NFT game that you are launching. I don't think you've launched it yet or you've just launched it. So no, we rolled it out. It is available, but it's open beta. You know, it's a beta accessible to 100% of users because we need in complex projects like this, it is not possible to iron out some functionality without quite a lot of users using it. For example, matchmaking, you know, kind of, you can design it in isolation, but until you have at least tens of thousands of people playing, you don't have enough information and data to really start trialing matchmaking and start offering it to people. So, so, so tell us about the game. How does it work? 
Well, I mean, the, the starting point is, uh, well, you, you already, Kyle, you, you mentioned Stepan. And when Stepan launched, there were sort of two emotions that I felt. One was, wow, this is really cool. These guys have done a tremendous job in terms of kind of marketing and creating hype around uh, the whole segment. And, you know, kind of a lot of people understand what sort of move to parent is. The other was shit. It would have they just spent just a few months longer to iron out their token economics and not make it in Ponzi scheme, that would have been a heck of a lot better. And a lot of people did not share with me that sort of second sentiment. And they said from the very beginning, this thing is going to turn into death spiral, and then we're going to be spending shitloads of time explaining to people how are we different from Stepan and why we wouldn't end up in that same situation that they are. Basically, when we started thinking about our game and NFT game, there were sort of three things that we postulated. Thing one, it's got to be a cool game. It's not going to be a shit game that promises that you will become rich because there are so many of them and it is such a lame excuse when you hear Web3 game. You know, can you almost expect that it's going to be a real, real shite, but there will be token in it and there will be people playing it in hope that it would change their financial lives for forever. It's got to be a good game first. And then token and everything else should come in second because unless it's an engaging game, it's not a game. You can't use the word even game. And that was the thing that we spent a lot of time on. The second was it's got to be sustainable token economics. So none of that stuff that if it all goes well, everyone is laughing and it's fantastic and you know, kind of token values are great and community is happy. If all of a sudden the number of new users starts to dwindle, everything goes into death spiral and everyone's in tears and the community is in pieces. So we basically killed the whole idea of making our game into pay-to-play mechanics, because let's face it, the step in and many other is not move to earn, it's pay-to-play. You first have to buy an NFT and spend a lot of money on it, and then you start earning. And because you paid for the ticket, you really need to have a return greater than you paid, you know, kind of starting point, because you got rain for money, right? You charge me, I got to get that back. And we don't do that. Our NFTs are free. Millions of people can get an NFT. And our mechanic is to have really engaging game where you can win sweat from your opponent, but we take a battle fee. So it's a casino model. It's a percentage that goes out and the more people engage and the more people play, the better the overall token economics become because it basically becomes a token sync and then community votes. And if they vote to burn, that's tokens that are gone. And the Third thing is, we really thought about NFTs, and I do not believe in the current model of NFTs that it's scarcity and artwork that, you know, is going to kind of make the difference for the future. The utility is almost unlimited, and, you know, kind of ticketing, etc. is an obvious one, but in our case, is dynamic NFTs. So our NFTs are going to be evolving and changing with your level of physical activity in time of the day and, you know, velocity, your engagement with the app and your on-chain activity. To give you an example, if you are as fit as you two, then you're going to have really muscly legs. Have you seen our, our NFT? They're called legs. They are literally... Both, both Jay and I have tiny legs. As you're saying, <laughs> yeah, we're, both, you know, we're both really <laughs> tall and good legs. <laughs> well, then we're going to make you look good, guys. Yeah, okay. Okay. yeah. This is uh, trying. I saw it every day. Nice. Oh, okay. That's a nice yeah. booty, thick legs. That's yeah. what I look like. Yeah, today, that. This, this is mine. So they have spaghetti legs. If you're very sporty and you move a lot, you have that booch legs, uh, you know, like proper. So they become dynamic and they evolve and change on the basis of your activity. So they become your representation. So they collect their value is not coming from the fact that you sort of came in early and you paid a lot of money for them, but collective value comes from the sum of all the different actions that you took that made that NFT into a unique thing that nobody else has because nobody has 
show the combination of all of these different behavior that influence the character of this NFT. And because they're transferable, I would imagine that they're going to become a, you know, can some of them are going to become collector's items. I'm sure that nobody would want to have mine because once I get to legs and I don't know, <laughs> purple tights, you know, but there are some community members that have some really, really cool ones. I'm like, you know, team, why do they get this? <laughs> this. The, the cool thing about this, I think, is that the more of these games or different things you add on, it just creates more burn mechanisms. But at the same time, it also creates more reasons for people to be active, which just furthers your mission. So your mission and, and the further that people go along with that mission, the more that it makes this token more scarce. And so it's like, it's a win-win. And I absolutely love that. And that's what we need more of is these sort of win-wins, like this aligned incentives, which you've really created here in this economy. And I say it's economy because it really is an economy, right? I mean, it needs a a good currency for it to be a legit economy. And that's really what you're on the way to to creating. I think you said by this month, it starts to go deflationary. You mentioned that there's, I mean, one, you want a CMO to help you on the Web3 side. Obviously, you're doing well on the marketing for the Web2 side. You get 140 million users. That's very impressive. You said there's more just some issues on the Web3 side. The Web3 community maybe doesn't get it. I'm not quite sure exactly what those issues are. So as we wrap up here, I'd love to give you a couple of moments to our audience is the Web3 community. It's a bunch of people on Web3 that they get tokenomics, at least if they're not very new. They've learned it from Jay and I and, and from others that we've had on the show. And many of them are studying it, learning it through our newsletter, et cetera. So they have an idea. And this is really the Web3 community, builders, investors, et cetera. And so... You said you have an issue or the Web3 community might have an issue or maybe just a misunderstanding. So is there more that you want to say? Is there anything missing here that we haven't touched on yet? Like anything that you want to announce or say to the Web3 community, then feel free to take the floor before we wrap up. Yeah, awesome question. I mean, my brain sort of jumps. I think that the biggest point probably would be uh, around metrics and assessment of success. And as I mentioned, I think that TVL is a red herring. I understand how we ended up there, but I think that active users and engaged users is going to become more and more and more dominant because, you know, kind of does remind me of sort of 96, 97 internet. Nobody was talking about active users back then, but right now, if you look at the internet, even threads launch you know, 100 million installs and everyone's like, who gives a shit about installs? You know, mm-hmm. it's active users that matter. So, you know, can people understand that in Web2, I think that, as I mentioned, the economics of Web3 are even more prone to dependency on active users than in Web2 because in financial, in TradFi, a lot of fees and charges are actually based on the amount that you transfer because that would be a percentage of the amount. If you look at blockchain, it is a lot more democratized and independent of the amount that you transfer. So in a few years' time, are going to be a lot more focused on active users than even TradFi and Web2. That's what's going to make or break this industry, being able to attract next 100 million users, next billion users. And I think that I've been to Africa last Christmas. God, I mean, Maasai, they don't have electricity. They have only the solar panels. Each and single one of them has an Android device. These guys don't have banking relationships. And if they will ever get into financial world, then I think that then doing something for them, having a DeFi product that will be able to cater not to somebody with 100000 but somebody with $3, that is a kind of mass market adoption. That's what the world needs. The other thing is some of the very curious things that come from the community, like, you know, for example, cap supply. There is a myth that cap supply is the linchpin of success, while actually it's being deflationary that matters. It doesn't matter what, you know, kind of what supply is. Bitcoin has cap supply, but it is still an inflationary token every month. And look at how it's doing right now. It's some sort of basic economic stuff that hasn't actually been internalized. And to be fair, nobody was really educating and explaining how does this stuff work and it spontaneously spontaneously happened. And the last thing I would say is short-term versus long-term as a business that's already been going for eight, nine years. We're definitely thinking in these types of terms. When I talked about, you know, kind of us with some of the investors, 
they think like, you know, kind of in and out of a position within 24 hours and they want to have, I don't know, 20 X. So it's really quite sort of different attitude. And I would say that, yes, there is a room for this and there is probably an opportunity to continue making money. But as the industry is cleaning up its act and, you know, kind of, I've just seen report that, you know, kind of scamming and, you know, kind of financial crime is finally, you know, kind of starting to decline. And no matter how we look at it, there will be more regulation and, you know, kind of, we need to kind of look at it as actually an opportunity because for next billion people, they would want to know that this is not a wild west and there are some protections for them and it is going to make it easier for them to come in and bring their money and play in this environment. And therefore, we need to start thinking a bit, a bit more longer term. So active users instead of TVL. And let's start thinking about, you know, kind of about this world in uh, longer term and building for minnows rather than whales. Whales are fine. You know, they've got plenty of stuff to yeah, go. <laughs> we don't need to build things for them. Yeah. I love it. There's a real message there and what we all should focus on, which is what we're trying to push here every every day, every week at Web3 Academy is there's unfortunately been a focus on the wrong things for a lot of the market and a lot of the people in Web3 so far, but it seems to be shifting, as you said. And I think after this episode, a lot of big people are going to be checking out Sweat for sure. And maybe you'll even get a couple of CMO applications. You never know. The link, one, way, the link for the CMO position is in the show notes. Thank you. you. Check that out if you want to apply. That's going to be an amazing job. And they're in Lisbon with the sweetest office ever. So right by the water, I was there. It's sick. So check that out. We're open to any location. I mean, we are remote first. But we do have an office in Lisbon and we do have an office in London and, you know, some, some people go every day, some people work from home. Yeah. And we're really quite flexible on, uh, on that front. Okay. Let's do this quick speed round before we wrap here. Just a couple of fun questions for you, Olin. Yep. First question, one prediction for 2023. We'll launch in the U S and it's going to be <laughs> an amazing fucking success. Wait, you're not in the U S at all? No. You have a hundred million users and you're not in the US. Wow. Wow. That's impressive. Okay. Bullish. One thing you've bought recently for under $100 does not have to be a digital product that brings you joy. Can I talk drugs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, had, you had a mushroom adventure that opened up your mind about all mean. <laughs> It's a good question. I'm totally unprepared. You know, kind of when I think of joy, I always think about social situation and conversation like we had with Kyle outside of. Yeah, but those uh, were free uh, beers. Uh, so you didn't you didn't pay for any of those. Yeah, exactly. Beers, that was just the, those were free. I think that you know, can, to be honest, I think the best and most joyous things in the world are free. And going into nature, I do have an incredible uh, kind of Atlantic Ocean coast here, and going for a swim that makes you think not needing any coffees and going out and having a beer with uh, with somebody more intelligent than you and learning from them while having a drink is brilliant. Well, you're the first person to ever answer by saying it was free. I can't yeah, believe this good. is ever. Yeah. Wow. Uh, my mind is blown right now. <laughs> Last question. And you could take a, a second to think about this one because I know you're not yeah. prepared. If you had a billboard that 1 billion people were going to see what would you write on it? Your movement has value. Ah, nice. Okay. I like that. It's a good quote and is marketing for him. I like that. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting when you say it, everyone nods, but we need to say it more times because this is, I'm not a marketer, but I do understand that if it took 200 years to build attention economy, it's not going to take one month to build movement economy, but it is really encouraging and incredibly kind of joyous for me to see how the evolution of this conversation happened. And I recently went to Judge GPT and I went, does physical, human physical activity has tangible financial value? And the Oracle has spoken, it's has spoken and it's given me, you know, kind of pretty much our pitch, which I doubt that it scraped from anywhere. So kind of seriously in courage that this is becoming a you know sort of commonly accepted thing. Well, nine years ago when we've said that your movement has value, 
people would kind of shake their head and kind of go, well, what do you mean? Can, in what sense? So right now, it's completely different discourse. And yes, the more people kind of go and realize your movement has value, and the more you move, the more value you generate, you know, the better the world will be. And my business will also prosper. So, yeah. But also, it's a bit of a shill. But yes, it's hogging as well. But if you're a token holder, then it'll increase for you too. So it's she's sharing it with the community. That's the idea of voila. Voilà. On that note, if you weren't moving while you're listening to this podcast, get out there, go move, go get into the nature. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. Oh, like, thanks so much for joining us. Wonderful, wonderful episode. Have a great day. Thank you so much, guys. I had a lot of fun. Really appreciate this. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and subscribe or follow so that you don't miss the next one. While you're at it, there's a link in the description for our free newsletter where we provide timely and relevant Web3 insights so you can confidently build and invest in Web3. Make sure to subscribe today. One final note. This podcast is for educational purposes only and nothing we say is financial advice. Crypto and Web3 are risky and you should never invest more than you're willing to lose. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.